I think from uh, our previous introduction, uh, longtime college Mennonite church member, former dean and professor at AMBS, and is still very active. Uh, 10 things I learned about leadership. I'm looking forward to hearing that. Thank you, Joe. It is, it is often the case that I am called my mother's name, and there are occasions when she is called my name. And this is a complete mystery to us because we don't think we look anything alike. We think our personalities and things like that are quite a bit different. Our life experiences are certainly very different. But for some reason, um, it, it is common for us to be inter our names interchanged. I think it's probably the white hair. I think that probably is. <laughs> I in that direction. And the really good thing is that my mother is a good woman and we get along really well. So to be called her name um, is not an insult. It, it may be to her, but <laughs> it is certainly not to me. Um, I'd like to um, uh, kind of recap a little bit from last week. Uh, as a reminder, for those of you who were here, and also um, for those of you maybe who weren't, is um, interrupt just one thing. Sure. A request on the oh, on close to really mm -hmm. keep it as okay. close as close as you can. Okay. Now, why is my PowerPoint not advanced? I'm going to stop that for a moment and come back in a different way. See if that works. So last week, I um, said that from my perspective, I tend to think about organizations as being like organisms. They are constantly changing. They are often unpredictable. They adapt to the kinds of environment that they're in, and they rarely find equilibrium. We can sometimes think that they have an equilibrium, and sometimes they do. But most often, organizations are like organisms that are constantly changing and adapting. Organisms are always part of a larger ecology. So whether you're a family or a congregation or a school, you are impacted. Your organization, your organism is impacted by the, the other organisms that share the same environment. Um, I, again, I think that there are ways particularly congregations can begin to forget that, um, but it, it is the case. We're part always of something larger. In my experience, to be a leader is to need a wide angle view of what is going on with the organism, what's going on with the organization and its ecology. And it, it's the kind of case that I have found that I am not able, if when I become overly focused on one small part of the organization or the organism, then I am losing track of a whole and I often then end up um, having a skewed view of the organization as a whole. And I found as a leader that I needed a wide angle view. I needed to be uh, mindful of the organization, the organism as a whole. And then last week also, I, I had what I called the six Ps. Um, there could be 26 Ps, but I found six is as many as my small brain can keep working at at the same time. And I had identified those Ps as the person who is I identified as a leader, the people that are part of the organization or the organism, the place of that organism in that organization within its ecology, the purpose of leadership. And leadership, I find its purpose isn't always constant, either for individual leaders or for what the organization needs. Power, which often goes with structure and authority, 
And the last one is a little bit abstract, I call promise, which I see as an orientation towards something bigger, something beyond the organization towards which the, um, the leader or leaders have a view. Sometimes we talk about that as the organization's vision or its mission or um, its product or its purpose or whatever. I just use purpose in a way that might seem confusing. Um, from my perspective as a Christian who is trying to lead, my sense of orientation is what is God's work in the world? And how is it that the organism and the organization I'm with, whether it's explicitly church or not, in what ways is its activity connecting with or aligning with what God's hope and promise and purpose for the for creation for this world is. So that's a kind of recap. And um, I'm not going to spend any more time with that now. I'm hoping that because we got a little earlier start today, we'll have an opportunity to have a little bit more discussion at the end of our time. I'm curious how many of you recognize the phrase servant leadership, and I'd be glad to know that also from people in Zoom. If that's a phrase that's familiar to you, would you kind of raise your hand? Okay, I've got a couple people here in the room, I'm kind of quiet, kind of uncertain. Those of you who are on Zoom, or is, that a, is that a phrase that resonates with you? Can you give a high sign or something like that? So maybe we can see. I'd like to um, break the Zoom people out into uh, breakout rooms. And for those of you who are here in this room to get into small groups. And I would like you to think about, think together about the question, what images or characteristics describe your understanding of servant leadership? Another way to say that is, what is servant leadership? So we'll take about five to seven minutes and then have a couple of representatives, say from your breakout room or from your uh, from this uh, conversation here in the room, what are the characteristics of servant leadership in your understanding, or are there particular images that come to mind for you when you hear that phrase? So, okay, so the breakout rooms, they're good to go. And those of you who are here in the room, you could start getting into your smaller groups for about a five minute discussion. Rebecca, can you join when he joins? As opposed to when he too. John Leonard are all by himself. So you're in that room. Except you can't talk. Because you're, you're muted. Not 
John, can you hear me? I got a feedback here, I think. Yeah, you turn up your volume, you're going to see that. I'm not sure if this is going to work, John. In this room, if my volume is up, then it feeds back to the room. So, how about if you do the talking? Can you do the talking? I think we should do it later. Yeah, I can move into another room. I can move into another room. Three of us. Yeah, there <laughs> <laughs> An organism. When you hear that phrase, sir, what are the kind of images or characteristics come to your mind? In contrast to servant leadership, we think of a leader that is dominant. And I, and I see that servant leadership is much more than your listening. You're open to the suggestions, and uh, you allow those suggestions to affect each other. And out of that, you have a much greater base to work with. I, I think in college administration, I was like a two different kinds of leaders in my life. One of them was very much of a servant leader, and he gave power to everybody in his cabinet. And the other one was pretty much. In terms of this the organization, in terms of the school, did it seem like one style made for a heavier uh, struggle than the other one? would you would you say that the that the college itself um, that it that it was it was in a place where it's it was in a, a good place if you will there were not jobs of stresses or um, things like it, 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 that that yes they're day to day kind of things but not necessarily huge problems like financial problems or things like that people like that that's true it's true we were never in a place where there was a financial problem although. I, I moved into an organization which was a mental health organization. And at that particular juncture, there were not financial problems, but that quickly changed as the decade progressed. But always in the college of the 20th. And, and, and that had a tendency uh, to hinder uh, using some of the creative ideas that we thought we could use. But it didn't hinder people expressing themselves mm -hmm. and, and searching for the best way. Mm -hmm. and, and it felt like we were not just a team of the administrative cabinet, but we were a team also of the faculty mm -hmm. because their ideas were, were flowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, was a, it was a pleasure, actually a pleasure mm -hmm. to work. That administration and then moved into the second administration, but that was only going to do and it created tensions all around. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's hard to talk about those tensions that
Speak up, please, here in the room, can get us started. A leader is not arrogant or too forceful. Not arrogant and what? Too forceful. Too forceful. Okay. Other characteristics or descriptions? I argue that a leader is an enabler. An enabler. Does that make that person a servant? Or is that a little bit different expression than what a servant leadership leader would be? One, uh, one secular author said the leader is someone who removes roadblocks so people can do whatever mission is called for. So removes roadblocks so it does not impede the work of the organization or the organism. Um, who would, who would, from the Zoom group, who would volunteer to unmute or be unmuted so that you could um, share from your discussion? Group three, uh -huh. Jenny, Marilyn, and myself, John, um, looked at the image that came to us or came into our discussion was of an individual servant leader, H. Ernest Bennett who I think everybody who worked with him and under him all felt included under his leadership, that, that we didn't have to be necessarily told what to do, but we were enabled to use our gifts. And uh, in his retirement, his servant leadership took the form of being janitor at Prairie Street Mennonite Church for 10 <laughs> years. And he enjoyed it, cleaning yeah. up the spills of coffee on the church rug the fellowship hall, uh, cleaning the, the, the bathrooms, dusting, uh, uh, using the Dyson vacuum. <laughs> and he, he was in his glory in the yeah. last 10 years. Yeah. So in that case, being willing to do just about anything, uh, not, that the, not that the title of leader exempts you from different kinds of res uh, responsibilities or tasks. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else from the online group? Or the Zoom group, sorry, wrong context. Who is that, the name of a person? Ernest Bennett. 
He was the head of the Mennonite Board of Missions, I believe, for many, many years, and then uh, served as the church janitor. Anyone else from the Zoom group, please? Uh, I was in group one. Um, to me, a person came to mind rather than characteristics, and that's Atlee Beachy. And what was it about Atlee's um, approach, his, his way of being, his way of engaging people? What, what would you say? Uh, he was quiet, he was thoughtful. Uh -huh. um, just his personality, I guess. Okay, thanks. Well, for many of you know is that the term servant leadership was introduced in the 1970s by Robert Greenleaf. And um, it, I think in the church circles where I've been in, it is somehow, it has often immediate resonance. Um, it's, this is a phrase that I think for many uh, Christians, uh, Mennonite Christians, um, is evocative. I think there's ways in which we attach all kinds of images and descriptions and experiences with particular people around the phrase. Sometimes I feel like it's overly romantic, a little dewy-eyed, and sometimes I think our, our, the images and the connotations that we bring are actually unrealistic at times. One of the things that I worry about and, and, and to a certain degree is that I think among Mennonites in particular is that there are some ways in which the term servant leadership allows us to sidestep around questions of power and authority. Um, and, and I know that power can be a dirty word. I had a little conversation with Arlen Huntsberger last week that I won't reveal here, but the ways in which power is almost a word that it feels like we have an allergy against. And I would say that in my experience is that when any of us start underestimating the power that we have, we are most likely to abuse it. I have rarely been in groups, Mennonite groups or other groups, who have actually had a conversation about what do we mean by servant leadership. It's, again, it's an evocative term, and we, I think, many times start bringing our own assumptions about it, about what that means in terms of a style of leadership or um, a, a, an approach, a particular kind of status or equilibrium within an organization in which those kinds of images of servant leadership can work out. So I will say, um, this is going to be heretical, but I'm going to say that I have been skeptical of this term over the last number of years. And that doesn't mean that I reject it. But I am aware that much of the work on servant leadership until very recently was done by men. Wonderful men, great men, but being done by men, and in many instances, white men. So I, am, I have experience with other women for whom the term servant leadership has not been actually very good news to them as a way of understanding and framing what it is they are doing, particularly as they are feeling a call to leadership or they are emerging as leaders. If you think about it kind of historically, our image of a female servant is not necessarily one that inspires a sense of confidence or trustworthiness, effectiveness, power or authority. I mean, really, when you think about women who have been servants, what do you think? Um, and my observation is, is that when you start throwing race into that, when you have women of color whose roles often have been in society as servants, 
it starts playing with our notions about who they are or who they should be or what they should be as leaders. And it is the case that there are many women of color, not just women, I want to be clear about that, not just women, but women of color in predominantly white settings who sometimes are ignored or their leadership is they have to work very, very, very hard to be an acceptable leader in organizations. There are stories within Mennonite Church USA where women and men of color have felt this. So it's part of the reason why I find it, I find the, the phrase a little unsettling. And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that I throw the whole thing out, but I find it unsettling. I'm going to return a little bit. Robert Greenleaf says that a certain servant leader shares power and puts the needs of others first, helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. And that is a wonderful thing. But he has already assumed that the leader has power. He is not assuming that your power is questioned or that whatever. He's assuming that you have power and that you are able to exercise it in a way that actually does do the kinds of things that many of us wish for in a leader. And that is to remove roadblocks or to help people do the work that they have been called to do or to address a need that is very evident. And I have been at AMBS long enough to hear the experience of men and women who have been in places where servant leadership was assumed in some way, but never talked about, about what we expect out of that, who felt continually like any things that they tried to bring for conversation, any ideas that they had about where the congregation might move, end up being blocked. And they ended up being felt, felt like they had been given responsibility to keep this congregation together, but very little authority to be able to help it move, help it move, not, not tell it, but help it move in other directions. And what they find was that, was that, that a great sense over time of unhappiness and a sense of futility. So what I'm yearning for here is to have really um, robust conversations about what we mean by servant leadership if this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to agree upon as the way in which we are leading. What I'll say is that what the 10 things I've learned that I'm offering this morning has not, first of all, they have not been, first of all, animated by a notion of servant leadership. But what I've learned, I hope, isn't completely far afield either. So, and why I want this advance. Sorry, I'll try and get this started again. So, my top 10. This is not the David Letterman where you go from number 10 and go to that. These are not really numbered. They're just, they're not in any kind of priority. They're just that they come. Um, so the first thing that I've learned is that every person is a beloved child of God who is worthy of my respect and honor, my open-mindedness and heart. When I remember that, that puts all of my values, it puts my opinions, it puts my reasons for doing things in a larger perspective. It makes me keep clear about when my own sense of righteousness and rightness must stay in check. I don't know everything. I will say that there are particular people for whom it's very hard for me to acknowledge this very fundamental thing. That to acknowledge 
that this person is a beloved child of God when there is so much about the ways in which they present themselves or whatever or interact with me that I find that sometimes I gag on that phrase. And that says way more about me than it does about them. So I've learned every person is a beloved child of God and worthy of my respect, honor, open mind. I have learned that the spirit of God is present and active everywhere. I don't know how many meetings I have been in in the course of my life. It, the, this is where I most often notice it. But we're in meetings and we've kind of come to a standstill because there are multiple views that are out there. There are things that are looking right. We have roadblocks that we can't quite kind of get out of the way. We've come to a point where you know, the way forward is not evident. And in that kind of moment when we all, or at least I often as the chair of the meeting, realize that we have hit a point where we don't know the way forward, and to take a couple of breaths or whatever. I have been shocked by how often someone in the group, maybe me, most likely not, says something that at that moment kind of blows the log jam out of the way. It isn't necessarily a revelation of what we need to do, but it's the thing that is needed that helps us start thinking in a different way about what the possibilities are. And I can't name, I have no idea what to call that other than that it is the spirit of God that's at work. And often, even if it takes several meetings after that to kind of get something all worked out, there is a moment where that thing came to light and it set us on a pathway now where together we could find a way forward. I find that there is a constant tug between the groups or the organization or the organism's wisdom and commitments and agreements and needs that are different from my own needs and desires. That tug I find to be quite great. And it's the place where I am more likely to start getting letting my own sense of righteousness interfere. Because I want, I want things my way. I just know that as a leader, that is a place where I end up expending a lot of energy. It's where it's not, it's not turned necessarily radically different uh, values or perspectives. It's just what is the dynamic realities of an organism? What is it that it's need? And what do I have the energy to offer? What do I have the time? Do I have the knowledge? And that tug I found to be constant. I found that listening to individual people and to the organization as a whole listening, and at the same time, observing what is happening. These are essential leadership practices. And yet with that goes along the requirement to test what it is I've observed or what it is I've interpreted with others to see if it is reliable. Is it valid? <coughs> So listening and observing, it's just these are constant practices that I found as a leader. But again, not to just rest on my own interpretations now, but to just come with other people. This one is a big one. And it actually, I think, has its roots back from my years when I was working with autistic and emotionally handicapped children. I have found whenever any of us feel hurt, angry, and tired, hungry, afraid, sad, ashamed, or guilty, and there are some other feelings on there. We all revert to being five years old. I just had this happen this week. I was in a Zoom meeting with someone, and I was not mad at Sarah. I was mad at this thing we were doing, and I've spent hours in the last 
four months trying to get a template to work properly and I can't and I kind of just blew up like a cosmic I mean a tantrum out to the universe because I am so sick of this problem that I have not been able to resolve I reverted to being five and it took me about 10 seconds to realize that I had reverted to being five and to catch myself and kind of laugh about it and kind of move on and say to Sarah, this isn't about you or whatever. It's sort of my big tantrum at the moment. I find we all do that. And once I realized that as a leader, that was really, really helpful because I realized I had a choice in my relationship with an individual or with a group. A group can turn out being five years old too. It is I have, I have opportunities to call that person back to their rightful age, to their maturity. And part of the way to do that is not to myself turn out being five. That, that, this has been a huge learning for me, absolutely huge. And realizing that any of us can get stuck in being five for several seconds, a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, a week, a month, God forbid, years. <laughs> I have learned that clear, robust, honest, transparent, and consistent communication is essential if an organization is to flourish. And I have learned that needs for communication are culturally based. Not every culture wants communication and information in the same way as another culture does. When I and Joe and I were living in California, we were part of the Southwest Pacific Mennonite Conference, South, Southwest Mennonite Conference, which at that time was comprised of um, about an equal number of Anglo congregations, an equal number of African American, an equal number of Asian, and a, a fewer, actually, ironically, fewer Hispanic, Spanish speaking congregations. The predominantly white congregations, when they got together for a conference, they wanted business meetings. We want to know what's going on. We want to know what the, how we want to be part of decision making. And it was very hard to get other Spanish and Asian congregations involved because in their culture, that's not really how you do it. You leave it to the leaders and the leaders will tell you what we're going to do. And they trust their leaders to do that. When there are problems, it gets messy. But by and large, that's their need. They were not interested in coming to a conference that was full of business meetings. So part of, I think, of what a leader's role is, is to also figure out what is the culture of this particular group? What is the kind of information? What is the level of information that is really needed and necessary for this organism to flourish? And to not engage in those things that that actually get in the way. I have learned that conflict, when it is spaced squarely in an overly and not excitable kind of way, when it is faced with patience and reflection, openness, honesty, and humility, can not always, yield very helpful outcomes. That the organism is actually stronger as a result of conflict rather than weakened by it. But if the conflict has been spawned at a moment when everybody is acting five years old, you're in trouble. It's big trouble. I have learned that readily accepting responsibilities for my being wrong, for making a mistake, for hurting someone, keeps the breaches that happen in relationships 
from escalating to something much larger. I learned pretty early that it was better for me and it was better for those that I was working with is that when I made a mistake to say so, to say I'm sorry and to try to make it right. When I tried to dodge that, when either because now I was five and I was afraid and feeling ashamed, I dodged that and started like blaming everything else. The whole thing just got out of control. Now, I didn't go around, I didn't go around apologizing for things that I didn't do. I didn't go around taking on all of the blame in the organization. No, I took on the things that were mine to own. And I learned the difference between a confession and an apology. What I find in many cases in the dominant culture is that it's okay for us to say, I was wrong about this. I confess that I made the mistake here or I did this or I did something else. And often we act as if by making that confession, we have offered an apology when we haven't. An apology acknowledges that the, that there was hurt or harm that was done to someone. What I find in our culture, the dominant culture, is that to acknowledge that I, my actions hurt or harm someone is much harder to do than to confess I made a mistake. So as I was a leader more, I, I got better at recognizing that when I made a mistake, when I did something wrong, when, when, when I needed to act in a way that was not exactly at the right moment and I, things weren't quite settled yet and people took that as being hurtful, is that to apologize and to recognize that there was some, sometimes big harm, sometimes little harm done in our relationship. And to own that. Two more. Leaders suffer. Um, that I think often, I think that often comes as a shock to many people. Leaders are constantly absorbing a lot of emotional energy that is going on in an organization. Organizations, first of all, these systems of organizations are emotional systems. They are full of people's joys and anticipations and anxieties and angers. They are full of them. And a leader is constantly having to sort of ride and understand these emotional currents within any organization. Families, schools, congregations. Um, and, and leaders are constantly needing to balance the varieties of conflicts that are present and also desires. We have learned from COVID that kind of that, that changes in an organization is adapting with COVID. What, how are we going to do this? We know that adaptation is exhausting. I don't know how many pastors I talked to recently, they are tired because they have had to keep adapting for how they're going to try to keep their congregations working and functioning together. And they're running out of steam. They're tired. They're running out of ideas and the like. What I'm interested in, in all of our talk about servant leadership, we don't talk about suffering servants. We don't talk about the ways that lead, people are called to leadership and particularly, particularly servant leadership that really is a very strong management constantly of their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own desires, their own hopes, their own liabilities, their own conflicts constantly managing that 
so that they actually then can serve the people who have called them. And when those things clash, it hurts. It hurts. Lastly, I this, this could have been number one, but I in some ways kept learning the levels of required trust. Trust is essential for leadership, but is an essential leadership quality. Trusting in other leaders and colleagues within the organization, trusting others who are part of that uh, organization and environment, trusting myself, what it is I bring, what are my liabilities, what are my strengths, trusting God's spirit, trusting that well-led processes can lead to, um, well, hopefully, good results, and trusting that there is often more time to work through an issue than I usually think. Not always. COVID was not a time where there was time to figure things out. We have been figuring things out on the fly for almost two years now. And as I mentioned, that's exhausting. But often there is more time and trusting that there is more time to let things work their way through and keeping all of us from reverting back to being five and being impatient. I don't know what time it is right now. I need to stop. Okay, um, those are my those are my ten. I've I took ten that I highlighted. I have probably one hundred and fifty, but I thought for our conversation, I, I, the time I, what I would like to send with you is um, question is I have my ten I put out here for you. What are one or two things about leadership you have learned? And because our time is up, I'm sorry to say we can't get there. But that's the question I would like to leave with you. Thanks so much. And thank you. See you in two weeks. <laughs>